Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to another episode of my walkthrough of uh, this fine book in preparation for its 20th anniversary on May 14th. And I've been going through one chapter per week, talking about the 12 chapters of this book. And uh, we are on the 11th week out of 12. And so this week we're talking about chapter 11, which is called The Notion of Computation. So just to remind people, uh, the, the beginning of the book, we're talking about kind of what's out there in the computational universe, from cellular automata to Turing machines to multi-way systems, these various different kinds of computational systems, what do they typically do? Then in the sort of middle part of the book, we're talking about, so what's the relationship between these systems and systems in nature? How do, they, how do these systems relate to the kind of mechanisms that things systems in nature have, the details of how systems in nature work, to questions about fundamental physics and so on. Then last week and last chapter, chapter 10, we talked about uh, when we see these things in nature, how do we, uh, what, what are the processes of perception and analysis that we apply, and how do those kind of connect to the kinds of intrinsic computational processes that we're looking at? Okay, what chapter 11 is doing is it's providing kind of a more formal concept of this notion of computation. All these systems that we've been talking about, we've described as being computational systems. We've described them as being systems where there is a simple rule that produces a computation. We've talked about systems in nature, where we can see what's happening in nature, where we can describe it as a computation. But now we're trying to get a bit more formal about this notion of computation. And it's kind of a setup for the grand finale, chapter 12, the principle of computational equivalence, which is kind of the big principle that kind of I developed as part of, of a new kind of science. Um, that's the, the big sort of principle that explains and lets one go forward in lots of ways. And it's been an important guiding principle in these last 20 years. And I think will be increasingly important going forward. But so chapter 11, the notion of computation. So let's dive in and take a look at um, uh, what's there. Um, and let's see here, there we go. So the notion of computation. So we're gonna be talking about kind of the general idea of computation. Then we're gonna be talking about the notion of computation universality and about all of the equivalences between different kinds of computational systems. Again, as kind of a setup to this principle of computational equivalence. Okay, so let's start off talking at the beginning about just this notion that computation is a general way of thinking about things. Um, and uh, uh, the, 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 the kind of contrast between sort of a mathematical equation and a mathematical way of thinking about things and a computational way of thinking about things. And one of the key contrasts is in a mathematical way about, of thinking about things, you expect to have sort of in one gulp, a full description of the system. Whereas where you say, here's a formula and it describes the whole behavior of the system. In the computational paradigm, you expect to say, here's the program that you run to get what the system does, but you don't expect to have sort of in one gulp, the full behavior of the whole system. So, uh, okay, so then, so how do we map the things that we've been talking about in things like cellular automata, other kinds of systems to computations. Well, a typical way that people think about computations is as a thing that has a purpose for us. We say, we're going to compute the value of pi. We're gonna compute the sum of these numbers. We have a concept or have had a concept that computation is an intentional kind of thing. One of the big points of a new kind of science is that that isn't the whole story of computation. Computation is a concept in and of itself, a disembodied concept that does not rely on the, on the idea that there is an intention for the process that's going on. Computation is more a story of the process that's going on than it is a story of the intention, the intent of what you're going to compute. Okay, but let's try and connect those things together. So this is an example of a very simple cellular automaton that uh, you can see it's one of the elementary cellular automaton rules, 132. And we can say, well, what's it computing? And say, well, it's computing whether the number of black cells at the beginning is even or odd. Because if it's an even number, 
you get white at the end. If it's an odd number, you have a trailing black cell at the end. So we can think of this as achieving the intent, the intentional computation of computing whether the initial string of black cells is even or odd in length. Okay, let's go on and look at some other things. Here's another example of a cellular automaton that uh, computes the square of any number. So you feed it in four black cells at the beginning, it'll go, it'll rattle around here, and then it will generate 16 black cells at the end. Now, one thing you might sell it, say is, there's nothing magic about that. I can see it computing the square. Well, yes, that's a feature of a computation which where we can understand the intent, we can understand the process. One of the things that's great about a cellular automaton computation is that we can explicitly sort of see the computation happening right there. And indeed, we see squaring happening right there. You know, we're going, we're sort of counting down here and we're, we're laying down squares and we're computing a square. Okay, well, what about, um, what else can you compute? Let's do some other kind of mathematical computation. Let's say we want to compute the primes. Okay, so this picture is of a cellular automaton that computes the primes. I think I might have a color version of this. This is one of the cases where maybe color is useful. I'm not even sure if color is useful here. I don't think that's actually any more useful. It's prettier, but it's not perhaps, but it's not more useful. Okay, let's take a look at this picture. What's going on here? Essentially what's going on is it's running the sieve of Eratosthenes. It's running things back and forth and it's figuring out every, it's, it's making all multiples of every number. That's what's, and every time it makes, successfully makes a multiple, it produces a gray stripe on the left. And so the things where, which are composite numbers will have a gray stripe on the left. Those things which cannot be made by this kind of sieving system on the right here, uh, those are left over as white stripes. And so those white stripes uh, eventually extrude the primes. So again, it's like, well, we can see how it works, but that's the point of having a sort of intentional program, so to speak, is that we can see how it works. We can see it's computing a thing that we might have sort of said in kind of an everyday fashion that that's doing a computation. So we can see this really is doing a computation. In this case, it's computing the primes. Uh, this particular rule has how many cells? 16 possible colors for each cell. So it's kind of a complicated rule. What is the minimum rule? that computes the primes? Good question. Actually, it'd be a good project for our summer school to try and find more minimal rules uh, for computing primes. Um, and no doubt there is a very simplest rule that can compute the primes. And I'm going to guess that you could find with nearest neighbors, I bet you could find one with five or six colors. Um, and uh, if you allow next nearest neighbors, probably um, uh, uh, even fewer colors than that. But in any case, that's an example of sort of computation where we can recognize what the point is. Okay, so let's see. Um, if we just say sort of cellular automata from the wild, we can start asking this question, well, what do they do? Um, and how do we describe these computations? Well, rule 30, it computes what rule 30 computes. Say, what's the point of that? What's the description of the computation? What's the narrative around that computation? Well, there may not be a human narrative around that computation. This is something I think we've had an increasingly good understanding of in very recent times in connection with the physics project of this is kind of part of the story of observers and things like this is what is the narrative description that you can expect to give of something? And that's a very different thing from just what the thing itself does. It's sort of what's the purpose of the thing as opposed to what's the mechanism of the thing. So uh, what, what I'm discussing here, I'm trying to, okay. The, 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 this is kind of like saying, the, these are things where a computation is happening. We just may not have kind of a human way to describe uh, that, that particular computation other than to say it's mechanism, oh, it's running this particular cellular automaton rule. Okay. So the big thing when we talk about computations is this phenomenon of universality. Um, so I'm, I'm talking about the fact that, oh, we can get a cellular automaton and it can compute the primes. We can set up the hardware of the cellular automaton so that that particular cellular automaton just computes the primes. But the big discovery that was sort of, um, you know, kind of bubbled out starting even in the in with people like Ada Lovelace and so on in the 1800s and um, emerged more seriously 
in with Moses Schoenfinkel in 1920 with combinators, although it was hard to understand at that time, and really you know, became clear in 1936 with Alan Turing's work on Turing machines. Um, but, uh, and it sort of that got filled in as a thing that um, uh, was, was clearer when it came to Lambda calculus in 1935 and, and uh, uh, tag systems, uh, the 1920s and so on. And it sort of all filled in this concept of universality, which then sort of got, got traction when people started building actual digital electronic computers in the 1940s and 1950s and so on. Now, I have to say that this phenomenon of universality was thought to be a kind of mathematical, logic, and engineering kind of thing until pretty much the 1980s, and probably until my own work on kind of uh, sort of the ubiquity of things like computation universality and the ubiquity of computation as a paradigmatic way to think about, for example, things in nature. It had been believed pretty universally by, by physicists and people sort of around the physics kind of world that yes, there might be this idea of Turing machines, but while it didn't apply to the physical world, which was a world where one was dealing with mathematical concepts and real numbers and things like that. I think now with our physics project, we can really say with some definitiveness that no, the, the universe really is computational all the way down, but that's something that emerged very gradually. And this idea of universality, the idea that there was sort of a universal way to, to set up computations, which had sort of emerged at a theoretical level in the 1930s, wasn't really thought to be a thing that would extend all the way to nature until really much more recent times, the 1980s and even, even the, the, the NKS book and so on. But what this section is talking about is the, the, the traditional phenomenon of universality, the idea that computational systems in and of themselves can be universal with respect to other computational systems. So the real question is, do you have to, if you want to do different kinds of computational operations, do you have to sort of uh, buy a separate piece of hardware to do all those computations? And sort of the thing which has caused the computer revolution to happen is the thing that makes software possible, is this idea that no, you don't have to do that. You can buy one piece of hardware and merely by changing the initial conditions, the program, make that thing do the different operations you want it to do. So I'm talking here about, um, uh, uh, about universality and about its potential application to natural science and um, but then what I guess I'm going to go into here um, is um, that, uh, you know, one of the issues that um, one has or one had in, in the notion of universality, and one of the reasons why people thought that, well, you know, was the universe computational? Was it a universal computer? Well, the sort of the intuition had tended to be, how do we get universal computers to use in practice for ourselves? Well, we have to have CPU chips. And in those days, they might have had millions of transistors on them. Today, they have billions of transistors on them. And do you need that whole elaborate, you know, billion transistor CPU chip in order to achieve universality? It kind of had the sense that one did need to go to a lot of effort to achieve universality. Even the original first universal Turing machine um, of, of Alan Turing's was a pretty complicated Turing machine. And so that again sort of highlighted this idea that one needs sort of to put sophisticated effort in to achieve this objective of computation universality to make things programmable. Okay, so now I'm, I'm kind of exploring what it means to be universal. And here's an example of a cellular automaton that is universal. What does it mean to be universal? What it means is that by changing the initial conditions, you can, um, you can change what the, what, the, um, uh, what the system does. And so what this is doing is it's got a particular uh, cellular automaton that is running at every cell in the system. And it has, in this particular page, on this page, it has an initial condition for that same cellular automaton running at every cell. The initial condition is intended to emulate rule 254. And you can see there, we can kind of read out from the cellular automaton. It's fairly easy to read out the, um, uh, the behavior of that uh, rule 254 from this particular cellular automaton. 
Let's go on. Okay, next page. Same underlying cellular automaton. So same hardware, but now the initial conditions have been changed. And now what we read out of the behavior is not rule 254, but rule 90. Keep going. We can do the same thing, same underlying rules, same underlying cellular automaton, but now we've changed the initial conditions and now we're reading out rule 30. So this is kind of a, a very visual example of this phenomenon of computation universality. People should use this in, in textbooks about, about computation theory. I don't know whether they have in, in these intervening years, but it's a, it's a very clear example of, of how you really get kind of a fixed piece of underlying system, a fixed sort of hardware underlying system, but yet by changing the initial conditions, you can reprogram it to do different things. These are the rules fixed set of rules for the underlying cellular automaton that's being used in these cases. And I think I had a picture here. Yeah, this is, this is kind of how it works. And again, as soon as you unravel the thing, when you've built it in an engineering kind of way, the mystery is gone. You know, you've got these different, what you've got is in every cell, every sort of supercell here, the, the cellular automaton defines these supercells. And in every supercell, you're specifying the rule that you want the cellular automaton to use. So you've given, so that means that your programming consists of kind of laying down the, the innards of these supercells. And then the actual operation of a supercell works by sort of just, it, it, it goes, it explores, it, it probes the right cell, it probes the left cell, it kind of looks up in the contents of the supercell, and that is what it uses to determine what the cell will be on the next step, on the next sort of supercell step. Okay, so one of the things here is, great, you say there's a supercell of this size and it will deal with all the elementary cellular automata. Okay, we understand how that works. Okay, and there's, there's it doing a different elementary cellular automaton. Uh, okay, there's rule 30 now. So that's showing for the things that we saw before in big pictures, that's showing kind of the zoom in to show how it actually works, how the actual sort of, uh, how it reads in the rule 30 as its initial condition, and then actually operates according to rule 30. But now the, I think the big, the big sort of achievement here is, okay, but what about all the other cellular automata? So this underlying universal cellular automaton, great, we can program it to do the different 256 different elementary cellular automata, but what if we have a different cellular automaton rule, one that, for example, has uh, uh, more than nearest neighbor, uh, 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 more than nearest neighbor dependence? Can we also program that? Well, the answer is yes. So here is that particular rule emulating a cellular automaton with this set of underlying rules. So the supercells are a bit bigger here, it's a bit slower to run, but the point is that that underlying same hardware universal cellular automaton can also emulate these other cellular automaton rules, however big and complicated those rules are. So in other words, what, what's happened, which is the sort of the one of the big things in universality, is even though there's a fixed rule of a certain complexity, it, with appropriate initial conditions, can reach out to emulate a rule of any degree of complexity we want, any, any number of, uh, of, of cell dependency and so on. So that's an important feature of the concept of universality. Uh, one of the questions here is, okay, well, the thing I just showed is a cellular automaton that, that still had two, uh, two possible colors per cell. The question is, well, can this universal cellular automaton also deal with cellular automata with more than two colors per cell? And the answer is yes. And this is showing kind of a coding where a white cell becomes three white cells, a, a gray cell becomes a white, white, black, and so on. And this is showing how one can uh, do that kind of um, uh, do that kind of coding to go from the uh, uh, the, the gray and and uh, the the black or the three color cellular automaton to emulate it with a two color cellular automaton, just with a larger range of rules. Okay, so what this has shown is there is a universal cellular automaton that we can make, that we can exhibit with sort of an engineering construction that we feed it in, we set up its initial conditions, it's rather easy to program, and it will emulate any other cellular automaton. Okay, so what we're now going to talk about is how broad is this universality? If we invent some other kind of computational system, will it too be grabbable 
by this universal cellular automaton? Or is it going to be of another, is there going to be sort of another block of, of computational capability? So is it going to be, oh yeah, you can buy a cellular automaton machine, it will do any cellular automaton. Oh, but if you want a Turing machine, you've got to buy a Turing machine machine and it will do another block of kinds of computations. Or is it the case that there's just one bucket of universal computation? So what we're going to argue is there's just one bucket of universal computation. But to give that argument, we have to say, well, let's look at these other kinds of computational systems out in the computational universe. Can they be emulated, for example, by our universal cellular automaton? Okay, so the next couple of sections talk about that question. So this is about emulating other systems with cellular automata, um, and mostly it's rather easy. Like this is a mobile automaton. Remember a mobile automaton just has one active cell, but that active cell has a marker that indicates where it is and the marker moves around. So how do we emulate that with a cellular automaton? Well, it's rather easy. We just have a cellular automaton with two kinds of colors, one for the background and one for the active cell. And we just have these somewhat extended rules here. And now we can emulate the mobile automaton with a cellular automaton. Okay, this is the corresponding thing for a Turing machine. Again, we're just encoding the state of the Turing machine in additional colors of the cell here. And remember, we don't really need additional colors. We could spread this out and use additional cells and encode those colors just in additional cells and always have a two color cellular automaton. But this is showing kind of how you would emulate a Turing machine with a cellular automaton. Uh, what's next? Okay, this is a, um, a substitution system. So these are neighbor independent substitution systems where we're like replacing one black cell with black white, white with white black. And what we're seeing here is these are again, cellular automata that emulate these substitution systems. Now, one of the things we're starting to see here is the readout question. So what we're seeing is in, in, in a mobile automata, in a, in a substitution system, for example, we might be in these cases, we're doubling the number of cells at each step. In this case, we're increasing like Fibonacci numbers. But so that means in a cellular automaton, there's a maximum speed at which information can be transmitted. And so if we're going to like double the number of cells, we have to have spent, we, we, it means we're sort of having that exponentially expanding universe. And we have to, it's gonna take progressively longer in the underlying cellular automaton to achieve that doubling of the number of cells. So what we're seeing here is that we can't just read out as we could in the case of like the Turing machine here, we can just say every, every step of the cellular automaton corresponds to one step in the Turing machine. In this case here, one step in the substitution system might correspond to many steps in the cellular automaton. And that's what we're seeing here. We're seeing that the cellular automaton is almost sequentially going through and executing what the substitution system is trying to do. But as the substitution system makes bigger and bigger runs of cells, um, bigger and bigger, longer and longer strings, the cellular automaton has to spend longer and longer uh, doing what the substitution system says to do. So same thing, same underlying cellular automaton underneath. We've got an underlying, well, not the same cellular automaton in this case. We've got a cellular, same, a cellular automaton um, uh, underneath these, all the, in all these systems, but we are, uh, by reading out these systems at exponentially increasing uh, points, we're able to get this exponential growth of the substitution system emulated by the cellular automaton. And again, we can see, we can kind of read in the Fibonacci numbers here. They're going to be Fibonacci numbers that show up just from the operation of this cellular automaton now emulating the substitution system. So what we're showing here is cellular automata can emulate substitution systems, but to get the readout of the substitution system, you have to be a slightly more sophisticated observer than you needed to be in the case of the Turing machine emulation. Okay, let's keep going. All right, what's this? This is a sequential substitution system. Sequential substitution system, actually something that sort of reappeared in the physics project um, as a uh, we're, we're updating, um, in this case, I guess we're updating just, uh, sometimes you can do multiple updates at one step, I think, with the usual evaluation order. But we're basically scanning across the, instead of doing like the neighbor independent substitution system where we take one cell and we just puff it out into a, a collection of cells as specified by the rule, here we're scanning from left to right. And we're saying the block of cells which first match the pattern will do that replacement. 
And again, what we're showing here is how a cellular automaton can be used to emulate that process. But once again, there's sort of a readout issue because you don't, the, 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 what we've got is a way of knowing when these can be read out. Not quite sure how this one does it. I think it probably has a particular cell that gets into a particular state and that says, okay, it's ready to be read out here. And that's how you know that it finished a scan here. And then you can pick up these, um, these results and see where, uh, see where you get the successive steps in the substitution in the sequential substitution system are picked up at these different indicated four places in the cellular automaton. And it's a little bit like, you know, you have a computer. I remember the first computer that I used, which had a teleprinter, for example, on it. You know, it would sometimes you could get it to ring the bell when it was finished, so to speak. So it was going print, 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 and then it would ring the bell to say, okay, I've now finished doing the printing I needed to do. With um, uh, with more modern computers, it's a more complicated kind of thing. It's it's kind of like more like um, uh, you know that's a sort of user interface question of how does it tell you it's ready for you to look at it. Um, in this case, we're down at the very minimal level of individual bits, and it has a mechanism for telling you when's it ready to be looked at. Okay, let's let's look at another case here. This is a register machine, and uh, this is a um, uh, the emulation of a, of a register machine with a cellular automaton. Um, here we've got a cellular automaton on the right that is actually just emulating, I guess its program counter is the center cell here, and it's emulating the behavior of the register machine. Um, okay, and then uh, another thing, this is an arithmetic system. We're doing repeated multiplication by three in base two. Um, this is being performed here by a cellular automaton with 11 colors. Probably doesn't need to be as many as that. It will be another good thing to search for to find a more minimal example of that. But here again, this is the thing where we're doing digital arithmetic and uh, we've got carry bits running back and forth and things like this. Um, and uh, again, it has to say where, it has to have an indicator of where you should read out the results. But what's happening here is, is again, we're doing this piece of arithmetic directly in a cellular automaton. We're showing that a cellular automaton is universal enough that it can do arithmetic as well as doing register machines, as well as doing Turing machines and so on. So that's kind of making uh, a reality to this idea of universality in a cellular automaton. This is a cellular automaton doing logic circuits. This is doing logical operations like um, uh, P and Q. And you can see how the cellular automaton takes in bits here and uh, it has these ways of sort of combining signals from these bits. This is a more complicated operation with, with P's and Q's here, and it's combining those things. And this is generating the, the truth table uh, for, for this particular logic operation from the cellular automaton. And that's the cellular automaton rule that's being used down here. It's not a terribly complicated rule, but it's the thing that's saying how to combine the zero signal and the one signal and so on to implement logic. Uh, let's see. Oh boy. I'd forgotten all these things here. This was kind of like, well, wait a minute. What about random access memory? Can you, uh, uh, you know, where you're just saying here's an address in memory. Can you go fetch that thing from the address in memory? Well, you can do that with a cellular automaton as well. Here's an example. There are bits stored in the memory here, and this is writing a, a one at this location 19 in memory. And you're encoding here, the saying the one and the 19, you're encoding that. And as it goes over here, it's kind of cute because you can see this beginning of a nested pattern. That's, that's basically an address decoder tree or an address encoder tree here that's being made with a cellular automaton. In, in an actual computer, what you'll see is um, these whole trees of address decoding logic that are saying that you know in the layout on the, on the memory chip, where do you actually find uh, bit number such and such. Well, that you have to translate from the from the digitally specified address for that bit to the place where it's actually laid out in the memory of the computer. And by golly, that's exactly what the cellular automaton is doing. And you can even see the same kind of nested structure here being built up where it's doing the address decoding and finding the actual bit that it needs to, in this case, write. And then it's writing another bit here. And then it is reading a bit. And then it's writing another bit and so on. So this is this is showing that even though 
in a, in a standard computer, you have this random access memory where you can just say, go get me memory at this location. Of course, in reality, in an actual computer, you're doing that by going and finding the transistor that's at that location. And so it is with the cellular automaton. And this is showing how that actually works. Okay, so what we've shown there is that a cellular automaton can be used to emulate all these different kinds of computational systems. It's kind of suggesting that a cellular automaton really can be a universal computational system. Okay, what about the other way around? Uh, you know, how, how general is this kind of crosstalk between these computational systems? So now there's a section here about emulating cellular automata with other systems. So this is asking the question, can you get a mobile automaton to emulate a cellular automaton? Before we had a cellular automaton emulating a mobile automaton, but now we're doing the other way around, a mobile automaton emulating a cellular automaton. The answer is yes. Again, we have to decide when we're gonna do the readout. And we're gonna do the readout here when the, when the head of the mobile automaton is further to the left than it's ever been before. And then what we're seeing is the mobile automaton is scanning back and forth and it's scanning and it's basically making the, applying the cellular automaton rules sequentially, and it's telling us, oh, it's finished that scan line now, so now you can look at the cellular automaton. So this is essentially the compressed evolution of the mobile automaton is the cellular automaton here. Okay, what's next? Let's see, that's a Turing machine doing a cellular automaton. So we're, we're, there's the Turing machine, and it's that Turing machine there is a Rule 30 Turing machine. It is, if you look at it, Whenever its head is more to the left than it's ever been before, what you see is that the state of the tape for the Turing machine corresponds to the successive steps in the evolution of Rule 30. Okay, let's keep going. This is a, okay, so a neighbor independent substitution system is in a sense too dumb to do uh, any, to do general computation. Something which is going to make a purely nested pattern where you're always taking every every element and you're just puffing it out into a sequence of elements, that's not something that can do arbitrary computation. Um, this is a, a neighbor dependent substitution system where to determine how the thing will do its transformation, it is looking at its, its, its neighbor. As soon as you're doing that, then you can do, for example, cellular automata. Here are neighbor dependent substitution systems emulating cellular automata. Okay, let's keep going. This is a sequential substitution system emulating a cellular automaton. Again, we keep on, you know, you have to say, where's the readout happening? And then you potentially have to transform this picture. If you really want it to look like rule 30, you have to transform the way that you stack the, the, the cells up to make it uh, look like standard rule 30. But these are not transformations. These are very simple transformations that you're doing to know, oh, you have to monitor this thing to know where the readout happens. This is a very guaranteed, straightforward computation. You know, when you do an arbitrary computation, you have this issue of knowing, oh, what's going to happen? You know, is it, is it going to take, how long is it going to take to get to the answer? You don't know for a general computation. But these encoding and decoding computations have the feature that it's very cut and dried. There's a very limited time that they're going to take. It's You know they're always going to terminate. It's, it's something where you can just make those transformations here. Okay, so this is, these are, that's a sequential substitution system emulating cellular automata. Down here, it's a tag system emulating a cellular automaton, where in the tag system, you're just going and uh, looking at the front of the tape, and then you're, uh, based on that, you're, you're shifting down and adding things at the back, and that's enough with these kinds of rules here, it's slightly complicated rules, but that's what you need to, to sort of engineer a cellular automaton out of these systems. Okay, what's this? Oh, that's a symbolic system. That's, that's a, a transformation rule that's kind of like, uh, it's a bit like minimal version of Wolfram language or like a, a fancier combinator where you're just taking these sort of tree structured pattern expressions and you're making transformations. So in a sense, if all you had was pattern matching in Wolfram language, this is a way that you could make a cellular automaton out of pure pattern matching. What else do we have here? Oh boy, we're, we're keeping on going. This is a cyclic tag system. Remember, these are tag systems that are very, very, very minimal. They're so minimal that you can actually make a piece of rather mechanical hardware very easily that does a cyclic tag system operation. And the cyclic tag system just knows what phase it's in. And based on that phase, it looks at the, the first cell and then adds or, or, or not 
something uh, at the at the back of the string based on that first cell. And this is showing how a um, uh, a cyclic tag system can emulate a tag system. So on the previous page or two pages ago, we showed how a tag system can emulate a cellular automaton. So now we're getting much more into the translation by translating to something else. It's like you're trying to decode some human language and you have to translate first into you know, this language, then into that language, then into that language, and finally you get a dictionary that translates to English. So it is the case with these systems. We're going from a cyclic tag system to an ordinary tag system to a cellular automaton, thereby showing that a cyclic tag system is all we need to eventually get to, for example, a cellular automaton. And then the cellular automaton, in turn, can emulate lots of other kinds of systems. So we're, we're sort of branching out in this emulation structure um, by, by going from system to system. Uh, okay, the, this is again in the department of, of sort of how do you get something from something else. This is Turing machines with two colors emulating Turing machines with more than two colors. So this is Turing machines with, with just uh, black and white effectively on their tapes here, emulating a Turing machine here that has more possible colors, black, white, and gray, for example, here. And it's just showing that you can, uh, how, how, how you can do that. So that means you never need a Turing machine with more than two colors. Um, that's always enough to be able to emulate a Turing machine with more colors. Uh, okay, this is a fancier emulation. This is emulating a Turing machine with a tag system. Um, so, oh no, I'm sorry. With a tag system, it depends only on the first element at each step. So in the previous pictures where we showed a tag system emulating a cellular automaton, we were having a tag system where it looks at multiple, multiple elements in the strings at each step. This is a one symbol deletion tag system. And this is something where we're trying to emulate, uh, let's see, what are we doing here? We're emulating a Turing machine with that. And so uh, let's see, there's the tag system operating here. And um, uh, the way it's working is, the tag system actually is putting the left and right uh, pieces of the tape. So it's saying, where's the cell? Oh, I'm sorry, where's the, where's the head? Okay, I'm going to say what's on the left of the head and what's on the right of the head. And I'm going to indicate that by pieces of this string that's generated in the tag system. So if you follow this through, and I haven't done it for, for nearly 30 years now, um, but uh, if you follow it through, um, you'll find that this... Uh, tag system, uh, which just deletes one cell, one element at a time, can emulate this Turing machine here. So, and that's the rule for the tag system, showing that it's only deleting one thing at a time. And we're kind of conveniently labeling the tag system states by showing things with with uh, Turing machine heads in them. That's just a convention. We could label them one, two, three, A, B, C, whatever. Um, just that's a uh, helps the interpretation. But the point here is that we're having this tag system um, is uh, uh, is emulating the Turing machine. Um, okay, let's see. Oh, yeah. Um, okay, so this is now, again, in the what can emulate what. This is a register machine, a bit like that tag system case. This is a register machine emulating a Turing machine. So we've got purely this thing with numbers and registers and, and you know, we've got this register machine program that just says increment the program counter, decrement, skip on zero, all these kinds of things. Um, and that program can then emulate a Turing machine because what's happening is this is the, these are the, the registers here, the digits and the registers, those are used to determine what the tape of the Turing machine to the left and right of the head will be. And if we then sort of, uh, uh, change that to say we're going to stack things up uh, so that the the successive values, successive tape configurations align with each other, then we get back to the ordinary Turing machine here. Let's see, any other emulations? Oh, yes, a register machine. This is another register machine set up to emulate a Turing machine. This is a more complicated, let's see what's happening here. This is another Turing machine. What is happening there? This was a... Uh, Oh, that's a more complicated register machine. That's a simpler register machine where the behavior of the register machine is a bit more complicated um, to emulate the Turing machine there. So again, very much uh, a, you can get from anything to anything. 
This is an arithmetic system, kind of a generalization of the 3M plus 1 problem, where it's saying, I think this is a mod 30 system, where you just take a number, mod 30, and you're saying if the number is 12 mod 30, then, then replace it with 3N minus 1. If it's you know 18 mod 30, replace it by N plus 1. You've got all these different cases. And then that's uh, that's the that's the uh, you know it's a pure arithmetic system. That arithmetic system is being used here to emulate a register machine. So again, we've got this chain from in this case an arithmetic system, a generalized three n plus one problem, to a register machine. From a register machine, we can go to a Turing machine. From a Turing machine, we can go to a cellular automaton. What we're learning is that all these different models of computation they can emulate each other. And that's a big result because that's kind of the story of computation um, of computation universality. All right, let's take a little look at some of the notes that um, uh, for these various sections. Um, so uh, I talk about um, uh, starting at the beginning of this chapter. We're talking about um, here the history of computing, and uh, these are these are again in my view, really quite good capsule summaries of, uh, in this case, this is sort of the history of, of practical computing from the very first mechanical uh, computers like the Antikythera device and so on to modern programming languages and so on. Uh, talking about how practical computers actually work and um, uh, the, the, the relationship between uh, these kinds of, uh, of model computers like Turing machines or cellular automata, I'm talking about in 2001, there's half a million electrons for each, each um, bit in a, in a typical circuit. And um, uh, talking about, um, uh, well, this is software stacks and so on as compared to um, hardware. Um, that's amusing. I think at the time when this book was written, Mathematica was always italicized. For some reason, it wasn't there. Who knows? Um, okay, just a few other examples of, of cellular automaton computation. This is computing ceiling functions with cellular automata, uh, just uh, as an example. Um, and uh, let's see, okay, now, one of the things that's in these notes is the Wolfram language code for all of those different cellular automata. So this is the squaring cellular automaton. You'll see that it's been written out in a very convenient form with a bunch of pattern variables and patterns here, five or six alternatives. Um, that's, uh, you can run this to get the squaring cellular automaton. This is, uh, now there's the prime cellular automaton, a little bit more complicated, but again, it's, this is, and un undoubtedly this can be minimized further, and that will be an interesting project for all of these things to minimize that. Um, in fact, in chapter 12, I show some things about minimizing a doubling cellular automaton, not squaring, but doubling cellular automaton, and we can see explicitly how that works there. Okay, one question is, well, okay, you're squaring, you've got the cellular automata that do squaring, you've got cellular automata that compute the primes, but what if you threw random initial conditions into these systems? What do they do? You know, they're desperately trying to square, they're desperately trying to make primes, but they're actually gonna make a big complicated mess if you don't use the particular initial conditions which were intended for squaring or taking primes. It's kind of like saying, well, if you start this random program that's supposed to be a word processor off with a random bag of bits, it will not behave like a word processor particularly. Maybe it'll have fragments of word processingness in it. And so we see with this, uh, with a cellular automaton. Uh, talking about parallel computation and cellular automata. Um, Okay, now we're talking about um, universality, talking about the, the sort of precursors. I mean, to me, the phenomenon of computational universality was kind of, uh, people like Leibniz were sort of so close to having this, that based on logic that would sort of transcend the Latin or French or German of his time, um, and be a kind of what I would now call a symbolic discourse language. We didn't quite have the idea of computation as a thing to do with that language. He was more thinking of that language as a representation of things like legal contracts and so on. Um, so that's um, uh, that that. So it, it's sort of a remarkable thing to me 
that this idea of computational universality, which really can be explained at a pretty elementary level, and people, I think even, even young kids at this point, have a sort of visceral understanding of the programmability of computers. Same computer, different programs, different can do different things. Uh, and, and that's something which is now very sort of viscerally understood by us, but it's something that in the history of the development of ideas took an extremely long time to develop. It took basically until less than a century ago for that idea to, to take root. And it's sort of an interesting ahistorical that you can now explain that rather easily is a sort of ahistorical piece of education that does not recapitulate the actual history of, uh, of, of uh, development of thought. Okay, this is, these are examples of sort of universality in Waltham language, just showing you can compute the same thing in many different ways. That's kind of an example of this phenomenon of universality uh, shown in our language, that, um, that the language allows the same, same kind of computation to be done with various base sub-languages that are quite different. Okay, here are the rules for the universal cellular automaton, bit of a mess, but, um, uh, but they're finite. and um, uh, that's the important thing, is that this, this finite set of rules is enough to deal with programming any cellular automaton. You can feed any cellular automaton specification into this, and it says down here how to do that, um, and it can emulate it. Uh, okay, so these are more details about uh, converting from cellular automata with more colors to ones with, with two colors, just code for doing that. Uh, now, these other emulations, mobile automata to cellular automata, that's the code. Turing machines from cellular automata, sorry, cellular automata emulation Turing machines. That's the code, it's very straightforward. Substitution systems, a little bit more complicated. This is essentially a compiler from substitution systems to cellular automata. Um, and uh, that's some, um, and then what it's doing here is it's making a symbolic compiler where it's sort of making an assembly language where it's putting out in things like M of zero, P of one and zero. And then this is the, the uh, assembler that's going down from, okay, that was P of one and zero. We'll call that six in the final cellular automaton. Okay, sequential substitution systems, again, a little bit more complicated, um, uh, but, but again, just a compiler from the sequential substitution system to a cellular automaton, from register machines to cellular automata, more compilers. These are probably good exercises for people who are, you know, imagining compiler classes and things. These probably be a good exercise. Um, that's uh, okay. That's the multiplication system for multiplying by threes, I guess. Um, that's the logic circuit cellular automaton, rather straightforward. Uh, RAM again, rather straightforward. Uh, okay, now we're on to emulating mobile cellular automata with other systems. So this is the thing that builds a mobile automaton that compiles from a cellular automaton to a mobile automaton, uh, Turing machines to cellular automata to Turing machines, um, uh, cellular automata to sequential substitution systems. That's a rather straightforward transformation. Actually, that's a transformation that effectively I already, already used again in like the physics project to show that the uh, hypergraph transformation systems in the physics project can emulate cellular automata. That's, um, that's essentially the same idea that's being used there to do that. Uh, tag systems, uh, symbolic systems, cyclic tag systems, uh, okay, multicolored Turing machines from two color, slightly more complicated. Uh, that's that fancy thing of the one element dependence tag system emulating Turing machine. Register machines emulating Turing machines. Actually, these are not such complicated uh, compilations. Um, uh, they're visually a little bit complicated, but they're not very complicated in terms of code. Uh, register machine transformations. Okay, this is an example of uh, this, just sort of a, a random note of the kind that um, uh, you find in the NKS book all over the place. Random result that says the following three register machine uh, will compute essentially a square root. So this is a square root computing machine. And you get some sense if you were just imagining all the possible computations you might do, and you say, well, how complicated is it to program a register machine to do a square root? That's the answer. This is a square root finding register machine. Um, actually, it'd be fun to see the actual operation and to sort of watch it do its thing of computing that square root and figure out how it does it. And is it doing a Newton's approximation or not? I think it's doing another kind of approach that, um, that I talked about in the book that I think the Babylonians or maybe the Egyptians had also discovered back in the day.
Um, but uh, okay, uh, arithmetic systems like 3n plus one doing register machines. Um, uh, this is uh, the, this is a historical note about the, the correspondence between arithmetic systems and register machines was established by Marvin Minsky and John Conway also worked on it. That's just one of the historical notes. I knew both of these people. And um, uh, let's see, this is uh, Conway's um, case where this is showing a particular um, uh, uh, arithmetic system and what it does. Oh, wow, I'm talking about multi-way systems. I didn't know I had that in here. Um, uh, okay, this is emulating a K-color multi-way system with a two-color one. That's something that surely has come up again in physics project kind of days. Uh, this is now the, the, the more about history. Uh, okay, this is, this is we're now on a different section here. Um, all right, let's keep going and looking through the notion of computation. So we talked about the universal cellular automaton. We talked about emulating other systems of cellular automata, emulating cellular automata with other systems. Uh, I talk about a bit here about the implications of universality, what it means when one system is capable of universal computation. One of the things it means is that that system, even with fixed rules that might be quite small rules, can emulate a system with arbitrarily complicated rules. So it's saying that's the thing that allows you to say, I've got a model and it's rather simple, and that model is capable of doing all this complicated stuff. That's kind of one of the reasons that sort of you can generate complexity from simple rules is that even though the rules are simple, at least in principle, with computation universality, you can emulate all these other kinds of things. It's something that will come back again. We talk about the Rouliad in a physics project and what's been derived from the physics project. That's the Rouliad is really a play on universal computation and ultimately on the principle of computational equivalence, um, sort of as the as the possibility that there's really just one thing that that emulates all possible that, that deals with all possible computations. The fact that that's possible and that there is a a single Rouliad that's all connected that's a consequence of the idea of universal computation. Okay, well here's a here's a big thing uh, in the book, which was the. Uh, the question is, how ubiquitous is universal computation? To what extent is it the case that you have to go to a lot of effort to make a universal computer? Do you have to very carefully choose the rules and maybe you build the circuit and it's got billions of transistors and so on. Do you need that? Or is computation universality actually something ubiquitous? Well, what I'm going to argue and what the principle of computational equivalence says is actually it's ubiquitous. Actually, as soon as you have a system that isn't obviously simple in its behavior, it will turn out to be universal. That's what the principle of computational equivalence says. We'll talk about that in chapter 12. But as kind of the scaffolding and the evidence for that, we're looking in, in chapter 11 here at um, uh, some specific examples of that. In particular, at the rule 110 cellular automaton, which I had suspected from uh, sometime in the early-ish 80s was computation universal. And the question was, could we actually prove that it was computation universal? And that was one of the achievements that we had in, in, in this book um, was uh, uh, to, um, uh, to give that proof. It was, a, it was a bit of a hard-won battle with a research assistant of mine uh, kind of battling through trying to actually turn this into a, uh, uh, a, a reasonable proof that was at least somewhat comprehensible and that one could validate um, uh, the correctness of in a reasonable way. But so, rule 110, what is rule 110? Well, rule 110 is just a cellular automaton that um, uh, has these particular rules. It's very simple rules. So you'd say, well, if that can be universal, practically anything could be universal. Let's look at what rule 110 does. That's a typical thing that it does. You start off in random initial condition. It'll quickly generate all of these little structures. The structures interact with each other. It looks a little bit like that logic circuit cellular automaton that we had earlier. So the question is, can we turn this into something which is obviously universal? Okay, so what is gonna happen here is eventually we're gonna show that there is a cyclic tag system that uh, can, be, um, uh, let's see, that, that is, how does this work now again? It's been a long time since I thought about this. Um, in the end, you're gonna make, a, yeah, you're gonna be able to show that an arbitrary cyclic tag system can be emulated by rule 110. 
And since we now, we, since we know from previous sections that an arbitrary cyclic tag, that there exists a cyclic tag system which can emulate a Turing machine, which can emulate an arbitrary Turing machine, therefore, which can emulate a Turing machine which is already known to be a universal Turing machine. Therefore, if we can show that rule 110 can emulate an arbitrary cyclic tag system, then we've got a chain of equivalences that will show that rule 110 alone is sufficient to emulate any computational system, i.e. it's a universal computer. So we're, we're looking here at, this is a cyclic tag system, and we're looking at how we can sort of translate the cyclic tag system into operations that can be executed by the rule 110 cellular automata. Okay, so this is going to be, what's gonna happen is those structures in the rule 110 cellular automaton, combinations of those structures are gonna to correspond to pieces of that emulation process for the cyclic tag system. So um, th there's you know, a white element in the sequence, a white element ready to be added. All these things are representations of pieces of that uh, cyclic tag system story um, that are represented in the sort of low level machine code of these structures in, in rule 110. It's kind of reminiscent when we say in our model of physics, when we say everything is just made of space, but some pieces of space have a particular structure which we choose to identify as electrons. Or when we're talking about metamathematics and we say down at the level of Eames, there's just this complicated mess of transformations that are happening, but some of those combinations of Eames will identify that as a multiplication. And, and then that's what we sort of humanly extract from it. And so it is with Rule 110 that we're, we're giving an interpretation, a kind of narrative interpretation to particular, to particular combinations of structures here. Now, in the case of Rule 110, to get it to emulate a particular computation, we're going to set up these structures in a very particular way so that they are easy to interpret and so on. But basically, at the end of it, what we're doing is what's underneath happening is just the application of the Rule 110 rules, but that is being we're looking at the cases where you see these structures and these structures then have an interpretation. And ultimately, we have a narrative which allows us to see how it can emulate an arbitrary computation. Okay, so this is now talking about how these structures can be combined to produce the kinds of things we need to do for the cyclic tag system. And this is really complicated. Um, and this is a big complicated story, but what's happening here is that you have to be able to show that these structures can interact in just such a way that they uh, give you the uh, that the, the, they correctly can produce the cyclic tag system and that it can never be the case that one of these structures that you thought was just going to interact in this way, somewhere, you know, a million steps later, something has lined up the wrong way and, uh, it, and the whole system blows up. There's a lot of kind of number theoretic coincidences that you need to have work in order for these different structures to interact with each other and never kind of interfere and confuse the things. So there are a whole bunch of different cases here of close-ups. The, these are close-ups. This is a kind of a big zoom in. So this is the overall structure showing pieces of kind of that cyclic tag system being produced here. You say, well, how do you actually implement that? Let's zoom in. Let's see the machine code of how that's actually implemented. Oh, it's this thing like this that has a particular piece of the structure that's being represented by this collection of, of localized uh, objects and so on. Okay, so, that, so that's what's going to happen, and there are just more and more of these different cases that all have to work out. Um, but the big news is that, um, uh, uh, that it does work out, and um, okay, these are, this is showing how different cyclic tag systems can be compiled down to these things that ultimately compile down to the machine code of the Rule 110 cellular automaton down here. And that's, um, uh, that, that's how that works. These are just examples of uh, different cyclic tag systems, which all you can see have the same overall structure that can be run through the compiler to get all the way down to pure rule 110 code, so to speak. Okay, so let's take a look at um, some notes here. Uh, all right, let's see. Um, uh, what is this? This is. Ah, oh, that's right. I, I was looking for a note that wouldn't be there because 
the, the whole point is that this is the compiler for Rule 110. That's the compiler. That's the thing that takes uh, the any uh, cyclic tag system, the rules for the cyclic tag system, and produces an initial condition for Rule 110 that will emulate that cyclic tag system. Might take it a while, but it will always do it. And by the way, look at those scary numbers there. This is a complicated story of number theory and so on to make sure that everything lines up, that you do successfully get uh, the the um, that you do successfully get the cyclic tag system from the Rule 110 cellular automaton. I have to say these are these are not. I'm not really. I used to program in machine code a long time ago, but this is uh, this is the kind of thing where uh, all the details of this. Um, it's uh, uh, it's this is kind of research assistant territory of getting all this right and then validating it. And sometimes there are problems that have to be solved, which are more conceptual. And uh, that's my kind of thing. But when it's a question of getting all these numbers exactly right, um, that's the kind of thing that um, uh, I was able to delegate in this case. So uh, let's see, I, I talked here about the history of uh, universality in, in one-dimensional cellular automata. Um, there's there's a, um, uh, some history of this that predated this, the, um, uh, the NKS book. Um, I think it had gotten down to a seven color nearest neighbor cellular automaton was the best that was known before the Rule 110 case. And now Rule 110, um, then takes that down to a two-color nearest neighbor cellular automaton. So basically tells you that the simplest, uh, um, the simplest kinds of cellular automata, just the elementary cellular automata, are sufficient to, to get computation universality. And that kind of tells you that far from computation universality being this distant thing that relies on um, uh, you know, having every bit in uh, in the in the CPU chip set up the way it should be set up. It's something that even with this extremely simple rule, you're you're able to um, uh, uh, to to get, and that's an important conceptual result. Okay, going back to um, the uh, the chapter here. Um, after talking about um, uh, the, the the proof of Rule One Ten. There's a section on the significance of universality in Rule 110, and basically making this point that I was just making, um, that uh, um, the um, um, that Rule 110 has uh, th this this universality in Rule 110 kind of gives you a hint of what I um, had kind of uh, asserted as a general principle, the principle of computational equivalence that as soon as you have behavior that it's not obviously simple, it will turn out to be universal. So I had thought earlier in the 1980s, actually, about what I uh, about class four cellular automata, the case of cellular automata that have localized structures and so on. I had suspected that they would be cases where, yes, there would be computation universality. And by the way, it would be comparatively easy with a, a emphasis on comparatively to prove universality. In something like Rule 30, I suspected there would be universality, but it would be very hard to prove. It would be like taking, you know, when we make computers, and particularly this has been very obvious in the last decade or two with quantum computers, as people try and take other kinds of physical systems, forget whether they're really following quantum mechanics or not, other kinds of physical systems that aren't like electrons and semiconductors and try to use them to do computational things, you're like, can you really separate out the atom and have it interact with the other atom in just the right way? Or is it all kind of uh, jumbled together? Is it kind of like a turbulent fluid where, where there's computational jumbled together? Or can you separate the pieces of the computation? And what one has discovered in the case of like trying to do quantum computing and so on, trying to make physical computers like that, it's very important to have this kind of separation to make it engineerable. And so what I had identified back in the, in the early 80s was that um, uh, class four cellular automata were a case where engineerability was, was more readily at hand. Although it took a bunch of work with Rule 110, for example, to actually do the engineering, it's at least plausible with uh, class four cellular automata that it's a sort of a finite process of engineering that has to be done. So these are a few examples of class four cellular automata showing these localized structures, these particle-like structures. Um, and uh, 
uh, the question is, how would you show universality? Um, and uh, uh, one approach is the kind of approach we used for, for Rule 110 of identifying those structures, trying to see how one can sort of collect those structures together to do things which are kind of identifiably computational and so on. Um, what other approaches might there be? So, uh, okay, well, actually, this is talking about other cellular automata that um, uh, seem uh, with different kinds of, of behavior and being able to, this is rule 184 um, and uh, this is rule 62 with certain kinds of information transmission. And it's kind of asking what really is the threshold of universality? What might be universal, what's not? Uh, these are additive cellular automata which have features where um, they tend to be uh, 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 simple. Um, this is rule 54. Rule 54 is a cellular automata that I'm sure one can prove universality and just hasn't been done yet. It's really hard. Um, it's uh, You can see these structures. It has very definite structures. This is the pure rule 54. This is a blocked rule 54 where you're bl taking blocks of cells and you're compressing it. You're sort of doing coarse graining by a factor of two, I think, here. Um, and... Uh, uh, and you can see these kind of structures that develop, which can have all kinds of complicated interactions. Um, and so this is a candidate. Uh, okay, this is this is showing some of the sort of interaction between structures in Rule 54 from particular small initial conditions. Actually, this would be a really good thing for us to try to, to do a bigger search on to find what other kinds of things can happen in Rule 54. I think maybe people have looked at this um, in the intervening 20 years, or, or now it's more like... Um, uh, 30, it's more like 40 years, actually, since I first started talking about Rule 54. Um, but, uh, you know, science moves, science is so funny, it moves so slowly and yet so quickly. I mean, the things we've done in the last couple of years have been sort of an amazingly fast motion of, of, um, of things about uh, physics and so on. But yet, you know, in 40 years, sort of the, the, the knowing more about Rule 54, it's probably only a little bit more known. And you can go back and see, you know, where there have been spans of 100 years or or more, where it's just there were, there, you know, it was a it was a question, it was posed, and it didn't get resolved. Uh, what one sees this with mathematics a lot, with particular kinds of, you know, the Fermat's last theorem type thing and so on. But um, it also happens with these very basic questions in science, and it's uh, it's an interesting thing, and it usually has a is a consequence of the fact that um, uh, sort of. The, the, there isn't a good paradigmatic understanding among a broad enough set of people to really make progress in these things. Um, okay, to continue. Uh, so let's see. Uh, we're talking about, um, uh, you know, you can look at structures, or here's another case. This is rule, rule 73, where you can, again, with particular initial conditions, with, with generic initial conditions, you tend to get these walls and you kind of prevent information transmission, which ultimately uh, has to lead to essentially finite sized pieces of systems, which prevents computation universality. But if you set up the initial conditions in a slightly special way, you can avoid those walls. And then potentially rule 73 is another candidate for universality, although it's more at the level of something like rule 30, which I think is going to be much more difficult to prove universality for. I think I might have a picture. Yeah. So this is asking about, uh, well, this is rule 73. Here are some localized structures in rule 73, kind of giving a little bit of a hint that there might be kind of a class four type behavior that you could see a way of taming rule 73 by only getting it to do particular things so that you might be able to engineer a universal computer out of it. What about rule 30? Well, uh, on a generically rule 30 um, produces just this complicated random looking pattern. But what if we put a special um, uh, periodic pattern as the initial condition and just a little crack in that periodic pattern? Could we control it enough to be able to get some kind of localized structures that, that we can sort of explicitly pull out and that we can look at the interactions of? I wasn't able to get that to work. It's, it's something which conceivably can be done. We certainly can, can't prove that it can't be done, and I suspect that eventually it is must be possible, but um, uh, maybe it cannot readily be done with a periodic initial condition. Maybe it has to be a, another kind of very easy to generate, but not actually periodic initial condition. And maybe one has to be more sophisticated about the ways that one picks out these sort of particles in rule 30. I mean, it's kind of like in, in physics and the universe, 
we say, what's a particle? You know, I, I just wrote this thing on the concept of motion, talking about kind of what are things that can be thought of as objects? This is the same kind of story. What are things here that can be thought of as objects? Actually, that might be a good note to add to my motion uh, piece. I'd sort of forgotten about this, this question here. Well, anyway, so this is rule 45. Rule 45 generically is very much like rule 30, but look at this crazy thing. With particular initial conditions, rule 45, which usually produces random stuff, actually produces a nested pattern. So that kind of, again, speaks a little bit to the universality or potential universality of rule 45. Even though you thought it was one of these rules that just produces random stuff, here it is successfully emulating rule 90 and emulating a um, and producing a nested pattern. So that kind of suggests that with the right initial conditions, if only you knew how to set up the initial conditions correctly, you could probably emulate anything with rule 45 so that it would be universal. So this is a question of to what extent, so this, this kind of raises the question of given a cellular automaton, how can you set up initial conditions for it to emulate another cellular automaton? So one approach is the one that we use for rule 110, where you're basically identifying structures, you're building something that's a bit like a computer, and you're saying, here's how I program it. But another possibility is to go in more at the level that we're going in with rule 45 here and say, is there a way of just having blocks of initial cells so that those blocks of initial cells can uh, be set up to make one cellular automaton emulate another. So here's some pictures of how that works. So this is uh, rule 146. This is rule 22 here, the underlying rule, emulating a bunch of other rules. So rule 22 is emulating rule 146, where in rule 146, a single black cell in rule 146 is emulated by a black cell followed by a white cell in rule 22 and a white cell by a white cell followed by a white cell. Here it's emulating rule 240, uh, which is a, a shift rule. Um, and here uh, a, a black cell is emulated in the shift rule, is emulated by this long sequence of cells in rule 22. So what you're seeing here is part of the sort of the network of what can emulate what. So for example, this is showing that rule 110 down here can emulate rule 170, which is a shift rule with this particular sequence of, of, of uh, where a black cell in the shift rule is this block of cells in rule 110 and so on. So this is a, a much kind of lower level form of compilation where we're just saying, instead of saying, we'll build up this whole structure with computers and, and a whole sort of language with, structure, with, with uh, localized structures and so on, instead, we're just gonna go directly in and say this pattern of bits is gonna emulate this bit in this other cellular automaton rule. So, uh, right, so that's, that's showing how that can be done, how one rule can emulate uh, uh, others in this kind of way. This is rule 41, emulating all kinds of rules. I think in the notes here, I show, that's interesting, that's in the data repository. Why isn't that a note to, um, that, that's the data on what can emulate what, but I was pretty sure there was a note in this section that showed a picture of the emulation thing. And I think that's a mistake that it's not a note for page 702 there. Uh, okay, so this is, um, this is the structure, uh, that's the emulation structure of cellular automaton rules. So that's the elementary cellular automata showing which rule can emulate which other rule. And in a sense, in, in a sort of fantasy physics terminology, you can think of this as the renormalization group flow of when you're making blocks in one cellular automaton, how does it emulate another cellular automaton? So those rule 22 emulates rule 146, which emulates rule 204. Uh, rule 146 can also emulate rule 90, um, which can then go, I'm pretty sure that, or maybe not, I'm sure it can go to rule 204. Why am I not seeing a path? Well, who knows? Um, in any case, the um, it's actually surprising that there isn't a path there. Who knows? Um, the uh, um, So anyway, this is showing kind of proto-universality. It's showing that rule 22 has, you know, emulates a bunch of others. I think this has been pruned actually. Uh, or maybe it's blocks of length eight or less. So by the way, that, that raises a point 
that this emulation process, this compiler, it's like how complicated does the compiler need to be to go from uh, a particular, the, how complicated is the compilation of this particular Turing machine, let's say, into Rule 110? Um, or uh, what, you know, how big does the emulation block need to be? And this is saying only up to blocks of, le blocks of length eight, but quite possibly there's an emulation of Rule 110 by uh, Rule 22, but with a block of length a million. And if we could find that block of length a million, we would have proved that Rule 22 can emulate Rule 110. Rule 110 is universal, so we would have proved that Rule 22 is universal. But it isn't easy to find blocks of length a million because you know you certainly can't explicitly enumerate uh, two to the two to the million possible blocks. So you have to have other methods, and I don't know those other methods. So. Uh, Let's see. Um, let me look at uh, back at the actual section here. Um, we're looking at the threshold of universality in cellular automata. So uh, we were looking, um, let's see, we looked here. Okay, so this is uh, another question, which is, okay, well, if we can't emulate, if we can't get like rule 30 to just have blocks that emulate rule 110, for example, can we even get rule 30 to emulate a simple logic operation? The answer is yes. If we pick out particular bits here, it's quite straightforward to get cellular autom to get rule 30 to emulate an XOR. That would be what we would need for rule 90, for example. If we pick out specific bits, we can get that to happen. But we need to have the whole initial condition configured in just the right way. And rule 30, in its natural state, in its kind of wild state, isn't generating the particular sequences of bits and in initial conditions to allow this to happen. So this isn't sufficient to give us a, a global way to emulate something with rule 30, but this is showing us some, again, some indication that rule 30 is capable of doing things like producing an XOR. Um, oh, this is rule 30 emulating, um, using that same strategy to emulate other elementary cellular automata. But again, it's kind of a cheat because here we're, we're specifying particular bits that will be the input to the cellular automaton, but we're leaving the other bits fixed. So it's if rule 30 happened to have a configuration that's like this, then by plugging into those particular bits, we get the, um, and the problem is we're not persistently able to have, we're not able to have rule 30 um, persist in having the rest of the state set up in the right way to be able to make use of those bits. So again, it's sort of an indication. It's picking away at this question of universality, but not quite nailing it. Uh, okay, this is um, okay. This is the same kind of uh, thing that we see, saw before, showing which cellular automata um, do how well at emulating other cellular automata. And what's kind of interesting here is the cellular automata that we can imagine are universal, like Rule 110, or even some of these class three cellular automata here. They, in that particular test of that very specialized test of sort of emulating things by picking individual bits, in that particular test, they do um, the, uh, um, these ones are successful in that test. Whereas Rule 90 or Rule 184, which feel like much weaker cellular automata, they kind of totally flame out on this test. So this is kind of an indicator, again, of what might be universal, suggesting that probably, just like Rule 110, all these other ones probably are universal as well. It's a question of how many centuries is it going to take to prove that? Okay, so let's take a look at some notes for this section. Um, Okay, claims of non-universality in, in cellular automata. The other is a funny one. This is uh, this is one of these things where claims of non-universality come in frequently. I, I just had one literally yesterday. I guess I looked at it about the S combinator, for example. People say, "Look, it does this. You can show that it 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 um uh with this particular set of constraints, it only does this particular kind of behavior. That proves it's not universal." Well, au contraire, because 
what you universality is a story of is there some encoding that doesn't kind of cook the thing that doesn't uh, not an encoding where within the encoding there's universality, a, a sort of a finite encoding where then the main work is done inside the system and then there's a decoder. And the question of what counts as a valid encoder, what counts as a valid decoder is, is somewhat flexible. It's, it's something where when we look at existing computers or proto-quantum computers, things like that, we imagine all kinds of uh, you know, encoders and decoders. One of the issues with quantum computing is the decoding process is essentially quantum measurement, and that's where things can unwind and where you can end up sort of stuffing your computation into the decoding process. And, and that's a danger in any of these systems where you're looking at universality. But, but people regularly will say, look, I proved that with these constraints and with this definition of what, how the encoding can work and how the decoding can work, such and such a system can't be universal. So there were many proofs in the literature that, for example, one-dimensional cellular automata couldn't be universal. It's just not true. It's just a question of, of, you know, somebody had a particular way of thinking about how the encoding and decoding might work and know with that way of doing it, it wouldn't work. But um, uh, that's not really the point. The point is, is it possible with an appropriate encoder or decoder to get arbitrary computation? Uh, these are just random notes about structures in Rule 30. That was probably weeks and weeks of computer time to find that one few word note here. Um, though in this case, it starts off growing quite slowly. I'm sure that there was... Uh, uh, a lot of computer time was sacrificed to find that result. Okay, this is rule 41. It's got some somewhat localized structures. Again, I didn't find a, um, uh, a great kind of full rule 110 like uh, zoo of localized structures. Uh, that's the emulations thing. Um, okay, this is the, the sort of general mathematical setup for the encoding of one cellular automaton by another through block encoding. Um, the kind of thing I was talking about. Uh, again, this is really kind of clearing up some confusions you might have about logic operations and universality, um, and the question of whether it's not really enough to just say you can emulate one NAND operation with Rule 30. You need to be able to put arbitrary collections of them together, and that's something that's that you can't do in Rule 30 at least not in the most obvious way, because Rule 30 is kind of bubbling around all the time and doesn't keep fixed the pieces that are needed to, to sort of do the, 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 the NAND operation. Okay, so now we come to another section here. This is almost the last section of chapter 11 about um, Actually, it is the last section. Universality in Turing machines and other systems. So this is, again, picking away at the threshold of universality. So Turing machines. What's the simplest universal Turing machine? Alan Turing's original universal Turing machine was really pretty complicated. My friend Marvin Minsky, with, with uh, uh, great effort, managed to simplify, the find the simplest universal uh, Turing machine, and he managed to get it down to seven states and four colors. And that record from 1962 had survived uh, all through um, the time uh, up, up until the NKS book and so on. So when the NKS book, we managed to get it down to two states and five possible colors. So a little bit simpler than Marvin Minsky's Turing machine. So we finally, we broke the Marvin record there, but then, uh, these are okay. These are these are Turing machines with um, uh, two states and four colors with complex behavior. Can we get it even lower? Okay, this is the big candidate. This is a Turing machine. This is the very simplest Turing machine that has complex behavior. Uh, and uh, the, the ones I showed on the previous page were, um, uh, let's see, I think those are four. Oh, two states and four colors. Okay. Um, this is now two states and three colors. Um, and it is the simplest Turing machine that does not have obviously simple behavior. The Turing machine is the simplest rule where the overall behavior of the system is not obviously simple. So here it is doing its head going back and forth kind of behavior. Here it is compressed 
so that we're only showing in this picture rows where the head has gone further to the left or to the right than it's ever gone before. That's kind of notable that this looks awfully, um, uh, awfully kind of cellular automaton-ish. Um, and so, uh, uh, okay, so the question is, what's the story with this Turing machine? And uh, I just want to show some things here that um, uh, talked about that. That's this Turing machine, 596440. Um, and I talked a little bit about some complicated behavior in that Turing machine. There are some aspects of this structure that are actually just like an additive rule 60 cellular automaton, but there are little glitches that happen and those little glitches are very complicated. Um, so uh, let's see, oh, this, this has to do with, um, yeah, this is not, not relevant to that. Okay, so, Drum roll, what happened with the um, uh, two-state, three-color Turing machine? Okay, so in um, uh, 2007, I decided to put up, a, as, as part of the fifth anniversary of the publication of New Kind of Science, I put up a prize, $25,000 prize. Could one prove or disprove the universality of this uh, two-state, three-color Turing machine? Okay, I thought this might be an open problem for hundreds of years, like a Fermat's last theorem kind of deal. Um, but I was thrilled that um, a few months after we uh, we put this out into the world, a young chap called Alex Smith um, sent this in this this long uh, document that purported to be a proof that this Turing machine was indeed universal, and it took some grinding around to determine that yes, this really was a valid proof. It's a little complicated because the, uh, the encoding that's needed to make this, uh, to set up the um, initial condition um, to uh, in, the, in the compiler, in Alex Smith's compiler was fairly complicated. And one could argue that, oh, unless it's blank tape or unless it's a periodic tape, doesn't count. Um, but the whole point is that the emulate, the encoder, is something which is a computation that always halts. There's no doubt about how much computational effort it's going to take to run the encoder, whereas the actual inner computation can be of arbitrarily complicated inner computation, which might not halt. And so that's kind of what you need to have something where you're showing that there is an encoding that makes the thing that exhibits the fact that it's a universal system. So this is another great piece of evidence for the ubiquity of computational universality and ultimately for the principle of computational equivalence. These are hard won battles. Rule 110 was complicated. This was even more complicated. Um, each one of these things, when if, if we nail Rule 54 or, or Rule 30 is sort of the big prize in terms of approving universality, and the Rule 30 prizes kind of get uh, at the beginning of trying to do that. They don't really... Uh, they don't just outright say prove universality because I think that's even harder than the things we are talking about there. Um, but anyway, one of the one of the real results in the time since the NKS book, there have been many uh, many smaller results. But one of the things that I consider to be a big result is this uh, Turing machine, the proof of universality of this Turing machine. So um, uh, let's see where were we? We were going to go back to uh, here we go. Um, Going to go back to uh, chapter 11 here um, and to our section on universality in Turing machines and other systems. So that was sort of the big potential prize at that time, which I didn't know. Uh, I didn't know that this would be universal. I thought it would be. That was my kind of guess. Um, the, um, uh, um, and, and this is talking about um, th three state, two color where there aren't really any, there don't seem to be any three-state, two-color Turing machines that are as complicated as that um, uh, two-state, three-color one, although that might not be true if you go to more complicated initial conditions. Okay, so I give another example of a simple uh, system that is capable of universality, and that's combinators. And sort of the embarrassing thing about this is that combinators were the very first system from December 1920 the, the very first system that were ever sort of considered as things that might be sort of general quotes computational systems, although the word computation wasn't being used then. 
And Moses Schoenfinkel, when he invented combinators, came up with something. Not only did he invent the first sort of symbolic universal system, it also is very close to minimal, which is completely not true of Turing machines or tag systems or, or lambda calculus or any of these other kinds of things. The very first example of universal computation, this is sort of a remarkable achievement, although it's been very hard to understand in the intervening years and has been largely ignored uh, for, for those purposes. But it is something where uh, this very minimal set of rules for combinators is universal. So here I'm showing, and I, I explored this in much greater detail in, in well, now, for example, this book that I put out last year about combinators, um, the, uh, that's a vastly more detail about that sort of puffing out this uh, couple of pages in the NKS book to a whole, how many pages is it? It's a whole, um, I have to look at this book. It's a whole, um, uh, how many pages here? A whole 400 pages in, um, in the combinator book. Um, but anyway, this is showing the particular behavior of particular combinators, the sort of evolution of combinator expressions. This is using a particular evaluation order. It's a kind of complicated story. There's another 350 pages to write about this. But this was my first sort of uh, introduction to, um, uh, to looking at combinators as, uh, as sort of minimal examples of computational systems in the wild, so to speak. Um, yeah, this is showing that combinators can emulate rule 110. This is a, as is a combinator that does one step of rule 110 evolution. Um, this is the actual process of that combinator doing rule 110. And it's kind of messy. It takes a lot of effort. You know, it's, it's running the combinator and th this is a representation of the combinator expression. It's kind of grinding around for a while and eventually the combinator expression is halting. Um, this is with a particular evaluation order is halting in the next state of rule 110. Um, so, uh, let's see, I think there were a few more notes in this section. Um, yeah, I talk about, um, uh, history of universal Turing machines. Um, well, let's see, Minsky's universal Turing machine. That's the one that Marvin Minsky talked about in 1962. Um, there are various Turing machines that were found, um, that didn't really ever make it below, uh, Marvin's result. Um, in a sense, people sort of could estimate the, the overall complexity of a Turing machine. It's kind of like how many boxes do you have to include in the specification of the rule? It's a product of the number of states and the number of colors. So the Minsky one was, uh, was 28. And so we can kind of see, are there smaller ones? Well, no, they're not. Um, they're, okay, actually, there's one with a smaller product, 24, from Yuri Rogozin. Um, and... Uh, uh, yeah, that's one thing we had to update in the in the book. Uh, we, we I tried to give dates for everybody, and um, uh, uh, while humans have finite lifetimes, um, the inevitably some of the people who were alive when the NKS book was published uh, died in the intervening years, and we've tried to add those dates here. Um, okay, these are what are these? Um, I can't even remember what this is. This is, um, uh, oh, this is, a uh, um, what is this? I can't remember what this is. Um, oh, this is, this is a, right. This is showing this Turing machine. This is a case, yeah, actually, this is sort of interesting. This 2-5 Turing machine, uh, is sufficiently direct in emulating a cellular automaton that you can just make a picture here and show that it that it emulates rule 110. Very direct. By the time you get down to the 2-3 Turing machine, nothing nearly as direct as this is known. It's a vastly more complicated emulation. It's like as you make the system, the, the rules for the system simpler, to get to something which is a human describable computation gets progressively harder. Now, that's not always true. Uh, there's a question of sort of the human describable computations, how far out are they? And to what extent is it the case that human describable things are simple in the machine code of the system we're looking at. And we can ask that about physics as well. Um, and what we're seeing here, and I'd sort of forgotten this actually, this is a nice result that with, uh, with uh, five possible colors, um, you can end up with a much more describable uh, sort of computational 
universality, at least when it comes to, to emulating other cellular automata. Uh, okay, more notes here. Um, okay, this is about enumerating Turing machines. Um, and this is about looking at uh, the 4096 two state, two color Turing machines. They all do sort of, sort of simple things. I talk about them a bit more in chapter 12, actually. Marvin Minsky had simulated these machines back in, um, uh, in 1960-ish, and he has a he had a nice comment. He, he told me about this that that um, um, you know they generated all these all these results and they're big mess and it's kind of hard to see what these machines are doing and and so on and so on and so on and and he he has some comment in his book about computation where he says that that none of these are universal and that the proof of this statement is unpublished and unpublishable, as in it's such a boring non-human thing that you know you have to just do it explicitly. It's kind of a computational irreducibility story, but interpreted in a very different way, interpreted not in terms of a fundamental limitation on computation, but more just as a practical kind of, we can't, uh, we can't get around to doing this. Uh, okay, that's the Turing machine that I showed you. Um, uh, this is now, what is this? Oh, this is about universal register machines. Yeah, I didn't put that in the main text. This is about a register machine that, again, is you know trying to find the simplest universal register machine, another good project we should revisit now um, to try to find the, the threshold of universality for all these kinds of things. But this is an eight register, 41 instruction register machine known to be universal. Um, and it would be nice to, to get... Um, uh, even even an even simpler case of that. Uh, okay, this is a oh my, this is an example of um, uh, right. This is recursive functions of the kind that Gödel talked about, improving Gödel's theorem, and showing that. Um, uh, that, well, it's a weird emulation path, that recursive functions can emulate any tag system. And so this, wow, this is a recursive function. We'll talk about recursive functions a bit more, I think in chapter 12, um, where, um, or maybe we talked about them in a previous chapter, I'm, I'm now forgetting. Maybe they're in chapter, uh, even in chapter four, where there are particular operations, zero, successor, uh, the recursion operation, it's kind of like a symbolic formula that says how to do the recurrence. And this is now saying that you can, you can make such a recurrence emulate a tag system. Okay, this is about lambda calculus, which is kind of a named version of combinators in some sense. And here's combinators. And this is, again, this is the, the minimal version of combinators before you get to the 350-page book. Yet again, proving that as is the case with many, many, many notes in the NKS book, um, many notes in the NKS book can puff, be puffed out into whole books. And I think I actually said that at the beginning of the NKS book, and I'm not sure anybody paid attention to it, but I said, you know, the things that are here, in many cases, a single note could turn into, you know, certainly a paper or, or even a whole book on its own. And I'm, I'm now sort of gradually proving that that's the case with things like the Combinator book. And so some of these properties here are discussed in much more detail in the Combinator book. Um, this is something actually not much discussed in the Combinator book. Um, it's kind of a hacky way to, well, the question is, are there single universal combinators? And what I've speculated and what the S Combinator prize is about is that the S combinator alone can be universal. You just have to be more sophisticated about the encoding and decoding of computation in it. But this is saying that if you allow yourself to be a little bit more sophisticated about how you do the transformations in a way that is trivial for the pattern matcher of Wolfram language, um, but might not be quite so much just like the way sort of mathematical functions, not that combinators work the way mathematical functions work, because they are a much more symbolic kind of play where the function itself can be symbolically represented. But if you generalize that a little bit, you end up, as, as Moses Schoenfinkel himself actually observed, being able to have a single universal combinator that um, is a combination of S's and K's. 
Uh, this is how the combinators for the cellular automata work. And uh, boy, this is the thing that I'd really like to do. Um, this is again, what the S combinator prize is about. It's like, is there universality in other kinds of symbolic systems, perhaps with different rules from combinators? It turns out that the, the S combinator is pretty much the simplest you're gonna get. Um, I don't think there are other ones, although there might be ones that are easier to prove than um, uh, for um, um, uh, than in the case of um, uh, of the S combinator. It might be that there are other combinators um, that you can set up where, again, they're single combinators and they have the same kind of structural complexity as the S combinator, but they're more difficult to, um, that they're easier to prove universality in than the S combinator itself. Okay, so one of the things that to mention, so we've seen this whole flow of all the, the concept of universality, all these different kinds of systems which are computation universal, and the surprising fact that even systems of these types with very simple rules like rule 110, like the two, three Turing machine, those are universal. That's a big fact because it kind of suggests that universality is ubiquitous. It's worth remembering, and again, it's sort of a confusion people sometimes have, that just because you prove that in general Turing machines can emulate cellular automata, doesn't prove that any particular Turing machine can emulate cellular automata. And that's where the difficulty of these proofs comes in. It's easy to show that there exists a cellular automaton that's universal, but to show that a particular cellular automaton like rule 110 is universal, that's where the difficulty comes. But having now established in this chapter, the idea of universality, the idea of the ubiquity of universality, we're kind of set up for chapter 12 and for the idea of the principle of computational equivalence, which is sort of a condensation of a lot of these results into a very kind of big, bold principle that I claim is sort of one of the more important principles one can imagine for sort of science and its implications anywhere. Um, this principle of computational equivalence, which has as a corollary, this idea of universality is easy to get. Okay, so that's, uh, that's what I wanted to say about chapter 11. Um, as I say, next week, we'll be talking about chapter 12. Chapter 12 is the biggest, bulkiest, meatiest chapter of the book. And we may break that into two sessions because there's really a lot to talk about there. And I will say that the, um, uh, you know, like one of the sections there, actually one part, one small part of one of the sections there, the part about implications for foundations of mathematics has now turned into the 250 page piece that I just posted and it will turn into a metamathematics book and so on. So it's again a... A uh, piece of a uh, piece of NKS turns into a whole book type story, um, and but that's uh, that's that's part of what uh, we'll talk about in chapter twelve. All right. So I see there are a few questions that came in, and I can perhaps try and address those. And if there are others people want to ask, please please ask them. Um, okay. There's a question from RBS. Are all universal uh, cellular automata um, irreducible? That's a slippery question. In the end, when there is universality, there is irreducibility. But within any irreducible system, there are always little slices of reducibility. So it could be the case that you have a cellular automaton where most of what it does is really quite simple, but there's this one little piece that is arbitrarily difficult to explain. So there can be a lot of squashing, a lot of reducibility that you can apply, but there's a one hard bit that you can't reduce. And so then in the end, there's computational irreducibility. RBS has commented that you can compute collapse sequences with rule 54, but it requires the Hamming weight of the configuration as input to the next computation. Okay, that's interesting. I, I don't know about that. That sounds interesting. Um, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a good vector to look at, rule 54 doing, uh, doing kind of an arithmetic system thing. I, I don't think I've ever thought about that before. Um, What is the longest computation on any one rule? I'm not sure quite what that refers to from Calais there. Um, I think uh, if you're asking what in practice have I done, I think we've run, oh, I've certainly run rule 30 in the center column for a billion steps, I believe. Yeah, it's, it's not trivial to run it for a billion steps because at a billion steps, it's if you stored everything, you have, you know, you've got two billion, it's a two billion wide pattern. And if you stored a billion steps of a two billion wide pattern, you're, you're talking about um, 
uh, 10 to the 18 bits, and you can't store that. So you have to have some optimizations to, to look at that. I think, I think maybe we've gotten a bit further. Maybe I've even gotten to a, a trillion steps. I'm, I'm not remembering. Uh, certainly in the case where we've got um, just a finite sized register where we just wrap around the, um, the cells, then we've got into the many trillions of steps, looking at sort of the the um, the, the re repetition of, of something like rule thirty in a fixed size register. Um, Zayden asks, "What's the difference between computation that takes place in nature and computation in, in man-made machines?" Well, that's sort of the big point. That in the end, it's all just computation. In quotes, man-made machines, it has traditionally been the case that we can we engineer the things so we can understand how the computation is happening. So you could like take the lid off, you know, take the open the hood, and you could see what's happening underneath, and you could understand what's going on. But that's really a fiction, and it has been for quite a long time. I mean, many of the circuits, many of the optimized circuits for doing things from sorting onward were found by various kinds of exhaustive search or various kinds of, of optimization algorithms. They're not human produced. And when we look at them, it is non-trivial to see what they're doing. And that's happening even, even more when we look at things like neural nets, which have been found by sort of randomized training. Um, it's really quite hopeless in many cases there to say, at a human level, can we understand what computation is going on here? And that's the same as what we see in nature all the time, is there's a computation. We can see that it's a computation, but we can't tell a narrative story about what's happening in that computation. And that's really, the, the, the in the end, the principle of computational equivalence is what shows us that the, the natural computations and the artificial computations are really uh, cut from the same cloth. And the only difference between them has to do with this question of which ones have a human story, uh, perhaps because they're created by humans or because we managed to decode them with something like science, and which are just computations in the wild, so to speak. And that, what I think is the case is that as we look at the future of technology, we will more and more kind of leverage computations in the wild. And so the distinction between what is the artificial, the man-made, human-made, the kind of... Um, uh, the um, uh, the things that were built by engineers, engineered in a way that we could understand, um, those will be less and less the kinds of things that we actually use in practice. More and more, the things we'll use in practice are things that were mined or created directly from the computational universe. Uh, let's see. Uh, Pando is saying, um, okay, so... What if computation systems were universal? What would it mean if it wasn't universal or if some new computing system could emulate the regular ones, but not the other way around? Yeah, so there is a notion of kind of hyper computation. I talk about that a bit in chapter 12 of systems that, for example, if you take a Turing machine or any one of these systems and it has irreducible, it's computationally irreducible, and you say, but look, I just have a lookup table that says what's going to happen. Even though the system had to run for an infinite number of steps, I'm just going to give it an oracle. This was an idea of Alan Turing's, actually. I'm going to give it an oracle which just says, the, and the answer is this. That kind of system is, is necessarily more powerful than the system that has to go through all of the steps. And as soon as one has such a system, well, it's more powerful than the existing systems. It can emulate the existing systems, but the existing systems can't emulate it. The big question for us, I suppose, is in our universe, in our physical universe, can we actually implement a Turing machine with an oracle? And the answer, I think, is no. Um, I think that's not something that our, that that is the sort of one contingent fact about our universe. Put in a different way, we live in the Ruliad and not the hyper Ruliad. We are, uh, we are sampling from computations and not hypercomputations. So one can, Im in principle, imagine a system that is capable of hypercomputation, is capable of doing computations that we are not able to do with the kinds of systems we've talked about. But the claim is that that is not something that could be implemented in our physical universe. Uh, William asks, is there a relationship between computation universality and, and Roger Penrose's triangle of mind mathematics in the physical world? In his world, a tiny part of each world encompasses all the next world bound into an impossible triangle. Are each of these worlds somehow a representation of computation universality? 
I don't know. I mean, that's the thing that Roger Penrose invented when he was a kid, this, this uh, weird perspective drawing of an impossible triangle. I didn't know he had, he had wheeled that out again in his uh, uh, 80s or so um, for a different purpose. It kind of gives one, uh, it's kind of a, a um, uh, I've just been looking at some of the, the things that went into the creation of the NKS book and remembering what I was doing 30 years ago and looking at all the things which I kind of invented 30, 30 years ago or more and kind of how they play on things we're doing today. Um, that's, a, that's a much greater span, I would say, in that case. Um, I, I don't know about this particular idea. Um, uh, yeah, I, I just don't know. I, I asked Roger Penrose, I, I don't know. Um, uh, it's, uh, I can speculate on what, um, um, uh, I, I would say that, that that sort of triangle about mind, mathematics, physics, uh, I kind of think that what we figured out recently about the Rouliad is the story of how those things are connected. And I have no idea what the, um, uh, um, I, I, I don't know about how that works. Um, let's see, William asks, is there anything a universal computer can't do? Yes, compute this halting problem. And so it isn't the case that one is simply tautologically defining sort of everything to be what a universal computer does. Uh, RBS comments, rule 110 can emulate rule 54, but, but rule 54 can it emulate rule 110. Well, that's the big question. Show that rule 54 can emulate rule 110 and you've proved universality for rule 54. That would be a, just a wonderful thing to have achieved. Um, memes ask, what will be required to prove that the universe is Turing complete? That is a, that it is a, a universal system. Well, if there is a universal system, then the universe is universal, so to speak. Um, you know, the, if, if any universal system exists, and again, there are little footnotes because the universe is presumably finite. And in principle, universality as mathematically defined is an infinite concept. Um, and so there's a little footnote about that. And there are other little footnotes, but I would say that the, the big thing that as far as I'm concerned makes it so incredibly uncontroversial that the universe is universal, so to speak, is the principle of computational equivalence and the increasing evidence that we get for that. And the realization that, that that all these different places in the Rouliad, all these different possible underlying rules, they all produce computational universality. They all produce computational irreducibility. They all have this slice of reducibility that we identify as the common laws of physics sitting on top of them. They are There is very ubiquitous universality. And so to ask the question, is there any universality in physics? No, it's actually, there's, there's always tons of universality in physics, I think is the answer, except for these kind of mathematical footnotes that say, but the universe isn't really finite. So the computation that we might need to, uh, sorry, the universe is really finite. So that computation, which we say is one of the things that in principle is producible by a universal computer is far, far out. Um, and in the, in the future history of the universe, and only you know, when we run the universe for an infinite time, could we really do that infinite computation to compute the infinite you know, number of this particular kind. So in that sort of pedantic sense, the universe isn't a universal computer, but I think in the sense that does it have rules which if you could run it long enough would lead to arbitrary computations, I think the answer is yes. And I think we have increasingly strong evidence not only that that's possible, but that it's deeply ubiquitous. All right, we should uh, wrap up there. And um, thanks for joining me. And again, you know, I'd like to comment that um, as, as we head for the anniversary of this book, we still actually have physical copies of this book, which people can get. I, I do, um, if you have a physical copy of the book, um, the, uh, uh, it's, um, uh, this is a version without its dust jacket. It, it looks a lot better that way. I recommend doing that. Uh, the dust jacket was there for distribution in bookstores. Um, for better or worse, you can, uh, when it's out of the bookstore, you can take its dust jacket off. And um, anyway, we'll be, we'll be doing some fun things with the physical book as we approach the, um, the 20th anniversary. Uh, right now, I've been um, spending some effort trying to write a piece about the making of the book, which I have to say is, is very... Uh, uh, 
uh, sort of personally frustrating because I thought I knew this history. It's my history. And, you know, a bit, admittedly, it's a lot of it's from 30 years, 30 years ago. Um, and uh, I realized there are so many twists and turns that I don't remember that are kind of interesting. And I'm going to try and write them down for people. Um, I think the other thing that I do find interesting is I've had the opportunity to basically read, a, I have email archives from that time, and read my email archives from 30 years ago. And it is kind of interesting to see that almost every story that starts 30 years ago now has an ending. And that's sort of an interesting thing to be able to see more of a human kind of thing, sometimes a scientific kind of thing. Of course, there are also stories from 30 years ago that don't have endings about and, and some of those things are questions that we've brought up here. Those are things which are really tough nuts, long-term science questions. Those are some of the kinds of things like the ones about Rule 30 that I've turned into the Rule 30 prizes, those kinds of things. But it's, it's an interesting thing to see that, um, that arc of history being, being, um, being explored. All right. Well, thanks for joining me and uh, 